and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Hello and welcome to a brand new series. Coming up in this episode, I look at the news and top selling Spectrum games for August 1985. I break out the light guns and test the Magnum light phaser and play some light gun games. I review some older titles. I look at a new release. We offer you some playing tips in a new section. Type in Connor is back. And I pick a demo of the month. But first, it's the news. Pymania, the adventure game from Automata UK, was one of the few to offer a prize for the first person to complete it. But this game was different. Not only did you have to solve the game, but you also had to work out a location and a date and time from the clues in the game, and turn up there to collect the prize. In this instance, it was the Golden Sundial of Pi, rumoured to be worth around £6,000. The prize was originally offered when the game was released in 1982, and some thought it was all a hoax, as it had never been claimed. The main problem was, of course, it could only be collected at a given location on a given date, meaning there was only one chance a year. But against all the odds, and to the surprise of the Doomsayers, it was finally claimed on the 22nd of July by Sue Cook and Liz Newman, who turned up at the Chalk Horse in Sussex to meet the pieman and collect their prize. Several high street retailers have dropped the price of the Sinclair QL. John Lewis will sell the unit for £299, while you can get a much better deal at HMV for selling it for £275. The machine had a rocket rope to release, and with Sinclair's recent troubles, coupled with the newer 16-bit machines on the horizon, this was seen as an old stock clearance by both retailers. For the first time, games have dropped below £1, with Central Solutions releasing four titles for the Spectrum at the budget price. Crystal Quest, a text adventure, Tangled Tale, a graphic adventure, and two arcade games, Valley of the Dead and Devil's Descent, are now available. Continue in the Sinclair saga, and their troubles continue as news breaks that the Robert Maxwell deal has collapsed. Sir Clive announced that with a recent £10 million order from Dixon's, refinancing is no longer required, but also followed up by saying he will continue to look for backers, which doesn't make much sense. Maxwell pulled out of the deal after accountants said it was not viable, and Sinclair's creditors, Thorn EMI, Timex, AB Electronics, Barclays and Citibank are still baying for payment. Meetings continue, but the Dixon deal should help. Sinclair are trying to trade their way out of trouble, with the new 128K machine being launched very soon, and rumours of a new 16-bit machine beginning to circulate. But at the same time, Hoover have stopped manufacturing the C5, until Sinclair deal with the £1.5 million writ they issued. And now on to the top selling games. New into the charts this month is Frank Bruno's Boxing from Elite. Step into the British boxer's shoes and try and fight your way to the title. Glass from Quicksilver, a multi-leveled 3D arcade shooter up. Dynamite Dan from Mirrorsoft, a colourful and sonically brilliant platform game. And Highway Encounter from Vortex, a 3D arcade game with Dalek-like robots. And that was the news and top selling Spectrum games from August 1985. Light gun games are very popular in the arcades, with classics like House of the Dead and Virtua Cop. But these types of games have been pulling in the cash since 1984, when Duck Hunt from Nintendo hit the arcades. Light guns eventually came to the home computer market, with several cheap looking plastic moulded guns appearing for many of the systems. The Spectrum had several, including the Tutor Defender, which I'll take a look at next month, and the Magnum Light Phaser. But there were only a handful of games tailored for them. Sinclair bundled their version of the Magnum Light Phaser with the Action Pack and the James Bond Action Pack for the Plus 2 in 1990. They did at least change the sticker though. The light guns work from the raster line on the television and so require a CRT tube. 
they just don't work on modern LCD or plasma sets. So for this feature, I had to replace my trusty old LCD TV for a very old CRT model I had to dig out of the loft. Also, because I couldn't find an emulator that emulated light guns, I had to revert to filming the TV with a camcorder. So apologies if some of the footage looks a bit rough. The Magnum and Sinclair guns are connected to the Spectrum via a single lead. This plugs into the auxiliary socket on either the plus 2 or plus 3. Be careful however, guns for the plus 2 don't seem to work on the plus 3, and vice versa, as I found out. Once connected and everything plugged in, it was time to play some games. The gun itself, to be honest, looks and feels cheap. It's light and easy to hold, and the trigger feels firm, but there's something cheap and nasty about it. The Magnum set comes with six games, but sadly my Magnum gun didn't work when I tested it. Maybe something to do with a rattling sound. Anyway, I switched to the Sinclair one and loaded up some games. First up is Solar Invasion by Mastertronic. The story goes, you are returning to Earth having visited an intergalactic zoo. With you are several new exhibits that you plan to show on your home planet. As you approach, you notice that some of them have escaped and it's your job to stop them overrunning the galaxy because they breed very quickly. The game screen displays a view of space along with a radar, score and ammunition count. The aliens drift about and take the form of different shapes and sizes and you simply have to blast them. Lining up the light gun was tricky and it took me a while to get my eye in. Even then it was difficult to hit them. There's no on-screen indicator of where you're pointing, so it's down to fine-tuning your aim really. As with all light gun games, the screen flickers badly when the shot is fired, which can be a bit off-putting and certainly gave my camcorder some trouble. Gameplay wise, it's a bit on the simple side, and probably wouldn't stand up as a game without the light gun. As each set of aliens are destroyed, the next set come in, and you repeat the process but with different graphics. There's some nice music on the intro screen, and some good sound effects too, but overall it's a bit boring and the levels go on for far too long. Let's move on to the next game, and Robot Attack, a game from Mastertronic. It's 2089, and the robots have taken over. The service droids have joined together to take over the world. They've banded together in groups of 50, and they set about building super droids. You have located the warehouse where all this is going on, and it's now your chance to shoot them. Your job is to pick off the robots before they can build one of their super droids. The original Z80 version I downloaded from WAS didn't seem to work. None of the droids ever built anything. So it was back to old school and loading from the tape, and eventually got the correct game. The screen is split into two areas. On the left is where the super droid is built, and on the right is the place where the service droids are working. They drop down the screen and head for various crates. If they get to them, a part of the super droid is assembled. To stop them, you just have to simply shoot them. There are 50 droids per level, and they have different attributes based on their colour. Blue ones are indestructible, red ones only collapse after a short while when hit, and some need more than one shot to destroy. Playing the game is tricky, again because of trying to line up the droids with the gun, and again we get the usual screen flicker every time you fire. It's a bit more lenient than Solar Invasion though, and provided a nice gaming experience. There's a nice tune on the intro with good sound effects too. The graphics are nice and smooth with some great animation. And I think this could stand up on its own without a light gun requirement.
With the gun though, it's still not a bad game. The time for each level is a bit long, and it could do with being a bit shorter, say 20 droids instead of 50, as levels do go on and on. As it stands then, a good idea for a light gun game that's well implemented. It could have done with something on screen to show where you're aiming, and this would have improved the game quite a lot. But it's not bad at all, and certainly past an hour or so. the next game and Rookie, again from Mastertronic. This is a run-of-the-mill shooting gallery game with a weak backstory. You're a new recruit to the army and are doing your basic training, and here you have to attain a certain level of accuracy. The game has two difficulty levels. On easy, it's very forgiving and makes for a rewarding game. The screen displays various landscapes which you can move between by shooting arrows at the top of the screen. Scattered around are various targets that pop up, on them are numbers representing the score, and they tick down slowly so hitting them early gives you more points. Randomly you will get more ammo to use, but overall there's plenty provided at the start of the game. To complete a level you just have to beat the qualifying score, which is displayed at the bottom of the screen, along with a timer. Using the gun is much easier than previous games, as I said before, and it's much more forgiving in easy mode. Targets explode when hit, accompanied by a nice sound effect, and the dreaded screen flicker. The pace is about right too, and at least you get time to try and line up your gun. As you progress, the qualifying score increases, so you have to be more accurate. The graphics are nice, the sound is good, and the gameplay is great. In hard mode, there didn't seem to be much difference other than the qualifying score was higher. Having never used a light gun before on the Spectrum, I have to say I was a bit underwhelmed to start with, especially as the first game needed almost pixel perfect accuracy. As I played other games though, the enjoyment factor went up, and I found that I enjoyed Robot Attack. The light gun element made a nice change from joystick or keyboard, and by the end of these three games my arms and wrists were aching from trying to keep the gun sights lined up. I'll be playing more light gun games next month. This is Metal Army by Players Software, released in 1988. General Ironside and his Metal Army have stormed Slough Power Station and are threatening to blow it up. Your job is to get inside and deactivate the bomb. Before I go into the game's mechanics and tasks, I have to say this game is verging on the frustration levels I got with Jungle Fever. I spent ages trying to get somewhere just so I could capture the video. The problems start on the very first screen. Here you have to get past four flamethrowers, well at least I think that's what they are. This involves pixel perfect movement, and so many times I never got further than this screen. There was no need to make this first screen so frustrating, it detracts from the game so much that I nearly didn't bother reviewing it. Anyway, once we get past this screen, maybe after an hour or so, you get a fairly run-of-the-mill flip-screen maze game with lifts and doors. The screens are populated by some nicely animated enemies that can be destroyed by either shooting them, closing a door on them, or lowering a lift onto them. Your weapon, a sort of laser thing, has a limited charge, but can be recharged at certain locations around the map, if you can actually get that far of course. There are different coloured doors, red ones you can just go through, but green ones require a key and these are scattered about the game map. Other obstacles, apart from the range of moving droids, are floor-based flamethrowers and metal spikes, both of which cause unnecessary frustration, especially when they're in the same room as constantly spawning robots.
There are other problems too, apart from the ones already mentioned. The lifts work well, but it's so easy to drop off them with the mistimed jump, meaning that you can't get back onto them, and you end up having to take a different route back, usually through a room packed full of droids and flamethrowers. The graphics move smoothly and are nicely drawn, and there's some great animation too. Sound is used well, it's just the gameplay that lets things down. I tried, I really did. I played this game for over an hour, but it all became far too annoying, and I certainly won't be playing this again. The Great Space Race was released by Legend Software in 1984. After Valhalla was released, gamers couldn't wait for the next game from this new company. Valhalla broke the mould, and had some wonderful scene written animation, and a sense of humour too. Legend began to advertise their next game furiously, touting it as something fantastic, featuring Movisoft 2, an ultra realistic graphics engine. They even claimed it cost over £250,000 to develop. The box was massive, inside you got a poster and a booklet that outlined the game and introduced the characters using a nice comic book style. Wow, this game looks great, I can't wait to play this. Or at least that's what everybody thought. The story goes that a wondrous alcoholic drink has been discovered that lets you get totally plastered, never leaves you with a hangover, and contains all the vitamins you need for a healthy, if somewhat inebriated life. This drink is known as Natoff, or Natoff, however you want to pronounce it. It's short for name to follow, because no one ever got round to actually giving it a proper name. So popular was this drink, that the demand was huge, and every wannabe businessman set out to capture the market, and so began the great space race. So it's your job to hire a team of racers, and their ships of course, to join the race and make you rich. Their job is to deliver this drink to the most profitable places, avoid pirates, and get you rich. At the start you are introduced to the characters, or at least some of them, that are participating, and get a chance to hire a racer or two. You also get to buy upgrades like lasers and shields, that don't seem to have any real impact on the gameplay. As the game begins, you get some graphics that look like they came direct from the ZX81. Did I load the wrong game by mistake? Your racers can be commanded to do things, but generally things will pop up on their own. Each option has a time limit in which to make your choice. As the game continues, you may get attacked, or want to attack someone. This takes you to a laughable space fight. Poorly drawn ships bounce around with lines drawn between them that's supposed to represent lasers. It's just comical, really. There's no control either, you just have to sit back and laugh. Sometimes you find a space wreck and a chance to grab some extra natoff, but these wrecks are booby trapped and you have to guess the code. There's no skill involved, just pick a random number, and you either succeed or fail. The game continues on its own, asking you for input at intervals. The graphics don't get any better either, as you can see. The character drawings are okay, with basic animation, but nothing like the promised software movie. On and on it goes, without any chance of upgrading your ship. An endless round of, your ship has been sighted, pay me X amount, or I'll attack. Attack takes place, start again. Ships can be repaired at certain destinations, but again there's no option to upgrade. Sometimes your racers reach a destination only to find another racer has got there first, and sometimes they drink too much and get drunk, requiring a sobering up fee. It's all very dull and a huge letdown, and I was glad when the thing ended, 
as my last racer got blown up by a booby trap. Good riddance, I say. Pole Position was released by Atarisoft in 1984. The arcade game was released in the arcades in 1982 by Namco and proved an instant hit. The built-in steering wheel gave players precise control of their racing car as they tried to first qualify and then compete. The fast 3D colourful graphics and great sound would make it a challenge for any home micro, not to mention how to convey that steering wheel into keys or joystick control. The Spectrum version is, if I'm honest, nowhere near as good as it could be. There are three main problems. Firstly, the colour of the ground. It's black. Why on earth is it black? There's no reason why it couldn't be green. This makes the game look odd. I suppose it was to get round the colour clash problem, but really, I'm sure it could have been done better. Secondly, the sound. The arcade had some great engine noise, and I know the Spectrum can't match it, but all we get is a continuous drone that never changes pitch. Because of this you don't get a sense of how fast you're going. There is a skidding sound, but it's just a beep. Thirdly, and lastly, there's no sense of speed. The roadside markings just flash, and don't really convey movement at all. The road signs are chunky, and sort of jump towards you in blocks. Oh well, on to the good things then. The scenery moves left to right as you turn corners, and the control is good. The joystick option, as well as all the other control options, are a bit weird. The car automatically accelerates on its own, leaving you with just left and right, gear changes and braking. Once you get used to it though, it sort of makes sense. The graphics of the car are good, looking similar to the arcade, and the crash effects are nice. Gameplay wise, once you master the controls, it's not a bad racer, and the collision detection is forgiving enough to allow you to overtake, even in tight situations. It's a real pity about the black colour scheme, because I know at heart it's quite a good game, but could have been so much better. This is El Stompo, released by Stone Chat Productions in 2014. You play El Stompo, a very highly skilled television repair blob thing. Your task is to fix all the televisions on each level by stomping on them. Of course it's not that easy, and there are a multitude of things to get in your way. Not only that, but the ingenious level design means that this is not just a platform game, but also a strategy game. Some platforms can be broken, allowing you to drop down, some can be moved, there are trapdoors, spikes, levers, and a range of animals to contend with, if you want to get your job done. Special blocks open trapdoors, and with clever manipulation, this allows you to get rid of some of the enemies. And other characters can trigger the levers too, that removes the floor, so timing is important. Some levels require collection of items to dispose of blocking creatures, and some enemies only chase you when you're on the same level. The game uses the Nirvana engine, which allows more colours to be used, in fact quite a lot more than normal. The Spectrum can handle one attribute per 8 pixel square, in other words two colours. The Nirvana engine in comparison, by some magic trickery, allows four attributes per square, so you get a lot more colours. The result, as you can see, looks brilliant. All 35 levels really look colourful, 
and not at all like a Spectrum. Sound is limited, but suits the game, and it would really be nice to have some sort of music playing, and I believe the author is thinking about adding this. The animation is fun, with some great cartoon-like movements, and the whole game sits together really well. This is a great game. Go and get a copy now. Hello and welcome to the Spectrum Show Plane Tip section. This time we're going to have a look at Alienate. There isn't enough time for me to explain how you complete the whole game. For that I suggest you go and have a look at my walkthrough which you can get on YouTube. I'll post a link in the comments section to this episode of the Spectrum Show so anyone who's interested could go and look at that. What we are going to do is have a look at three of the more difficult rooms and three of the rooms that I don't go through or complete in that walkthrough. So this is the first room and in this room it's just a case of getting from one side to the other but it's not that easy as you can see you've got killer blocks and they're raised up on top of standard blocks. Now to jump over a killer block, what you need to do is be two steps away from it. But there's a cyber rat in the room that's complicating matters, so if he comes near you, you need to just drop an object quickly. Then walk up to the normal block and walk two steps away. Drop an object and jump when the cyber rat's at a stay safe distance. Then just repeat that process to get over the second row of killer blocks and walk out of the room. This is the second room, and at first look it looks quite easy, there's a object raised up on four normal blocks with the platform in front of it, killer objects all around that platform which are also on a block. As with the last room you need to be two steps away from a killer object to jump over it. The problem is, that platform is made up of disappearing blocks, so after you've jumped over the killer objects, you will immediately have to drop another object onto them. Now to do that, you have to have your objects arranged in the configuration that you can see I've got here. So you need an object, a space, and then another object. And what that allows you to do is pick up an object without dropping another one, and then have another object immediately ready to drop. It took me a little while to work out how to do this room. You've also got to be lined up right in the middle of the room. So if you go out of the door that alienate is by now and come back in that lines you up right into the center of that platform the reason for that is one block will disappear immediately and if you were lined up exactly with that you'd drop straight down so you walk up to the two killer blocks which are in front of the platform walk two steps away you drop an object turn around pick up and jump and drop an object the second you land on the platform then you can pick up and jump up with that object again and get the object that's on top of the platform then jump down from the raised up blocks and you've completed the room and got your object this is the last room we're going to look at and in this one you've got to collect an object that's been guarded by a mouse Dalek and to do this, what we're going to do is trap him in the corner. So what you need to do is go right into the corner yourself and drop an object so you can jump up to the platform he's on and get rid of that block that he's banging against when he comes towards where you are. Now to do this and avoid him, what you need to do is drop an object so you can jump up and when he comes close, pick up and jump and then keep your finger on the jump button and press the rotate to the left button and what that will do is when you hit that object you immediately rotate to the left and jump at the same time and as you can see that will remove the block the mouse dialog will come through if you time it right and trap him in the corner you then go to the other side jump up on the three blocks drop down through the disappearing blocks and collect your object I hope those tips have been helpful Next time we'll look at a different game and some more tips for that. Until then, goodbye.
Welcome to Typing Corner, the section that brings typing games back to life and shows them for the first time in over 20 years. This episode's game is Foxbat, although the game actually is called Firefox in the listings. The game was written by A. Howes and published in Popular Computing Weekly in February 1983. The listing was quite small, with a mixture of basic and machine code in two separate sections. The idea of the game is simple, you have to fly a plane as low as possible. The lower you go, the higher your score, and obviously you have to avoid crashing. There is a fixed time limit, so to get a good score, you have to keep trying. The landscape scrolls across the screen, with the occasional tree planted on top, and your plane can be moved left, right, up or down. It's all about nerves, and how low you dare to fly. The landscape is the same each time you play, so once you've memorised the layout, you know what to expect. The graphics are average for a typing game, and sound is limited to just crashing. But for such a short listing, it's not bad, and certainly well worth a play. This is probably the first time the game has been seen since it was published, and will be available to download from my blog very shortly. Welcome to another new section, Demo of the Month. I think the title speaks for itself, so let's get straight into it. This month's demo is Outer Loop by Demo Scene. This is a TRDOS demo that runs on pentagons and scorpions. Maybe not true spectrums, but I like this demo so much I thought I'd share it anyway. The music is really nice and despite the interlaced beginning, it soon settles down and shows some good colour effects in animation. Some of the work is very reminiscent of Jesus on Ease on the Amiga. There are a few sections that seem to ignore colour clash too, all done very smoothly. and it ends with a haunting image. A really good demo and definitely worth watching. Well, that's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it and thanks for watching. You can get in touch by using the details on screen. See you soon.